Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining this uh, this open panel session. So we're hosting this together with New Forum and New Foundation. And generally our mission is to create a new economy with culture and infrastructure to support that. So this research session is really going to be interactive and we have different parts of this with our amazing panelists today, Scott Moore and Yancy Strickler. So I'm going to let Jordan introduce the actual panel and Jordan will be running most of the session. But in general, the concept is that we will go through some key topics related to the concept of coordinating a new economy and what this really means and how the collaboration between Gitcoin and MetaLabel is shedding a light on these topics and some of the underlying research uh, principles and ideologies behind the paper that was dropped in their collection. And uh, we'll dig into sort of the implications of that and core values and philosophies of where this new economy is shifting to. So super excited to have everyone here today. Please feel free to think about what you want to contribute towards the end of the session and any questions that you might have, as we will have a participation from any audience members towards the end. So thank you again. And Jordan, over to you. Thank you, Madeline. In terms of the run through, this conversation will be in two parts. Part one is investigating the recent collaboration between MetaLabel and Gitcoin, focusing on their core values and the influence of the paper by Vitalik, Zoe, and Glenn liberal radicalism. And following this, we'll explore manifesting public goods, what comes after the creator economy, and touch on cyber resistance, coordination, and meaning in the age of AI. So um, a lot of major but necessary topics for part one. And finally, part two will be a Q&A with the audience to explore further the topics discussed and we'll reserve a good amount of time for that. Uh, we'll start with you, Yancy. Uh, could you introduce your background and what led you to co-create MetaLabel? Or uh, what's up, y'all? I'm Yancy Strickler, dialing in from uh, Chinatown in New York. My first career uh, was as a music journalist, music critic, writing about records for Pitchfork and The Village Voice and Spin Magazine. And during that time, started a tiny record label, put out a lot of great music by some great artists. Eventually, life happened and came to be a co-founder of Kickstarter. I was the CEO of Kickstarter uh, for uh, several years. Really there, experienced this feeling of like making a door in a place where it ended up everybody wanted a door to be, but it just didn't exist yet. But this notion of allowing creative people to go straight to their audiences to make new work rather than relying on gatekeepers to give them approval. And then about two years ago, began working on the project of MetaLabel. And that really started with me being a lonely creator, feeling isolated in the creator economy, running a community, writing a lot, and just didn't enjoy the experience, even as like everything I thought I wanted was happening. I just felt isolated and alone and spent some time rereading a book I've read many times called Our Band Could Be Your Life, which is the history of hardcore and punk rock in the US. And what stood out rereading this book again is how there'd be a small group of people who started a band. Um, no one would put out their music. No one would let them play in their venues because they were too noisy or weird. So inevitably, they would have to create their own institutions. They created their own label. They would create their own DIY venues. And as soon as a group of people would start their own label, all their friends would say, oh, like we can do this. Can we do this too? Can you put us out? Can you, uh, we'll make music. And it generated a scene. And it was this moment of like a, a group of people seeing sort of this commonality of what they all shared rather than just their own practice. And just tracing the history of that, seeing, connecting that to the origins of the enlightenment actually with a group called the Royal Society who invented science genuinely invented science through monthly zines of scientific journals that taught people that created peer review. And so I've come to see that this infrastructure for uh, a way for creative people to collaborate and to unite around their shared goals and missions is something that has had centuries of great impact on the world. It's been lost for the last 15 years as our technological norms have taught everyone to be their own star, to be their own 
individual uh, channel rather than a part of something. And Meta Label is going to change that. We're, we're making a new creative paradigm for what it is to create work online and off. And uh, this is just underway. The collaboration with Gitcoin is like amazing. The very first piece that introduced the idea of a meta label talks about Gitcoin. And then our first drop with another group ended up being with them just by kismet and the beauty of the universe. And yeah, we, we feel like we're at the start of what will prove to be an extremely meaningful journey of helping other creative people feel less isolated and be a part of something bigger than just themselves. Awesome. Thank you for sharing, NC. In terms of the creative paradigm and what comes after the creator economy, we will definitely touch on this topic. Scott, to bounce back on what Yancy just said, uh, in the quadratic funding preamble that is part of the collection, you wrote that the original paper from Glenn Vitalik Zoe on liberal radicalism was quite influential on you in the creation of Gitcoin. So can you tell us about your background and the core values of Gitcoin with regards to this paper? Absolutely. And I, I'm just glad to hear so much being brought up already around uh, the sort of crisis of, I mean, in, in some ways meaning, but in some ways like connection within the way we create. I think it's kind of fascinating just to think about like the, I'm sure we'll get to this at some point, but the way that's, yeah, actually kind of evolved. John, yeah, John Riveki, great, uh, great thinker on this topic um, as well. And for me, I think I had a similar journey in a sense. Funny enough, when you mentioned the band sort of like uh, that were performing in this sort of scene that, that didn't really have anywhere else to go, I remembered thinking back to uh, when I was in early university playing in uh, actually kind of like a, uh, a hardcore slash, slash metal band. And we would just, you know, be performing in all the most ridiculous dive bars because that's who would, who would have us. And I think my journey in the last, five, six years has really been more so around open source software creators, who I also view as an important class of uh, creators. And, and people often think of uh, software as something that is more mechanical or is, uh, you know, somehow just uh, more practical. But I do think it is fundamentally creative. And I think that the creative act of making software is actually probably the most important uh, sort of part of it. So I started my journey in 2015 after working uh, mostly uh, using open source software previous to that to make closed source software, which was terrible. And so then I basically decided that I should figure out some other path for my career and ended up stumbling across very luckily a lot of the folks in the Ethereum community in Toronto. And I started working on this idea of founder collectives um, with this project that we call uh, very uncreatively actually uh, Venture Equity Exchange. and. We, at the time, this was just how projects in Web3 sort of worked. There was not really a lot of uh, forethought into the, 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 the context in which we would build them. But we started with this idea of, okay, let's let people create tokens. Let's let people trade those tokens together. Let's let them basically form kind of these uh, groups, these, these intertwined networks together. The DAO hack happened shortly after that, unrelated, I should say, and ultimately uh, we decided not to pursue that. It just wasn't the right time. But it got me thinking about this idea of, uh, I guess, less scenes, but more sort of online, um, as Yancy also mentioned, uh, institutions. And I think the most interesting institutions to me were actually GitHub organizations, which is where I'd spent probably far too much, much time. And ultimately, I decided to build a project that was based on the idea of trying to allow GitHub repos to kind of monetize in a more global sense. Uh, they're fundamentally, by their nature, like global organizations already. They don't really have a jurisdiction. They just kind of exist in this weird, uh, what we would now, I, I suppose, call like on-chain world, right? And that got me to have a bunch of conversations with folks, including uh, Kevin Iwaki, who I ended up uh, just sort of deciding to join forces with. And so Gitcoin is kind of this way to eventually create quadratic funding, but first it was just about any way to incentivize open source software creators. It was just fortuitous, and I'm sure we'll get to this, that quadratic funding kind of came up around the time that we were looking at sort of new models for grants in particular, and five or so years later, uh, we're here. I'm super excited to be here, and yeah, I, I'm very grateful to uh, all the folks that have supported uh, in that process over that time. Thank you, Scott. Yancy, based on what Scott just said, uh, would you consider Gitcoin a meta label? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, to I totally see Gitcoin and 
you know, even from the very inception of Meta Label, saw Gitcoin as an example of this. You know, Gitcoin is a group of people bound together by a shared belief of a form of cultural change or cultural idea they're trying to promote and support. And Gitcoin does this not by making a singular product solution that they're looking to optimize for their own ends. They're doing this by continuing to release products, creating campaigns, creating opportunities, different tools and mechanisms, means, ways of promoting this whole belief system of why around public goods, around open source software, around uh, how these systems depend on uh, a public participation or even corporations or projects contributing money to them. And they've done that in such a creative way. You know, there's like a totally dry way to do that, that no one would feel any sort of emotion about or feel passionate about. And that has not been Gitcoin. I mean, Scott is dialing in straight from the quadratic lands as we speak. Uh, and have, you know, the work of him and Kevin and, and everyone there has just been phenomenal. And it's that mix of like cultural point of view, mission, you know, seeing something larger than you. That's just so powerful. And I think it's like kind of the meaning a lot of people are hungry for, right? Like why do a lot of people feel dissatisfied while well, their job feels meaningless? Uh, they're working for someone else's capital accumulation. They feel little connection to what they're actually doing. They, where they feel most connected is maybe their hobbies or other things of which also they're in this competitive environment online of like who has the most followers doing whatever it is they're doing. All of these are just like challenging emotional places to be. So, um, I mean, meta labels, core values. I don't remember that tweet thread. So, uh, I don't have but, the answer cited well, a year ago, but what I would, what naturally comes to your mind when you're thinking of meta label and its main values, it's a group of people who share the same cultural point of view, agreeing to release work together. Um, for us, we're a team of six co-founders and principals who are all full-time, seven, including our board member, uh, Rob Kalen. But, you know, we're like a studio that's brought together by belief and the power of creative collaboration. We keep releasing work that is trying to manifest and teach people that way of seeing, is trying to demonstrate it. Everything we do, we first do for ourselves just because it feels like the right thing to do. And then if it works, we try to productize it and make it so other people can do it as well. Um, so we really see ourselves as like, we are capital M meta label, but everything we do is about lowercase meta labels in the long run. And then, you know, we're, we believe in egalitarianism. Um, we have an extremely flat ownership structure among the squad. We internally try to orient ourselves as a heterarchy. A heterarchy is a fluid hierarchy where we all have different areas in which we naturally lead based on our experience or our merits or our passion. And because we operate through distinct releases, each release will have a different director based on whose idea it was, who's, you know, where did that uh, idea emanate? I feel like we are just feel really lucky to be able to work alongside people that we care about and who we feel are at a similar level. You know, my, my lonely creator experience was feeling alone and feeling like uh, I'm a person with followers or something. And instead I'm like a part of a huddle of peers. And that is just the emotional experience is night and day, like my own personal happiness today versus a year ago. Like I don't even know how to describe. And I feel like that thing, thirst and hunger is like lives in the hearts of so many people. And I, I really feel that, and I hope that our structure becomes a path out of that and becomes a practical way for people to not feel so competitive and for people to, to feel more aligned for that to be practically possible. So yeah, yeah, all those things. So, so if I take the analogy of a musician, uh, you're usually playing for a crowd, giving to the crowd. So in this case, uh, would you say that you're manifesting public goods, but you're also enjoying the experience, you're providing something for others while having fun? Uh, because often as a creator, you have your audience. And as you mentioned, you're kind of stuck in a bubble where you're doing things. You don't really know what you're feeling exactly. And so you can cooperate with others. I really identify with people that don't see that line between audience and performers being that strong. Like there's a great band, indie band, uh, Lightning Bolt, who would always play in the round. They're, they wouldn't be on the stage, they'd be on a floor and everyone's in a circle around them. And just like the energy of that is just phenomenal, phenomenal, like such a difference. Everything we do, like we do because we want it, we do because we believe in it, but we also just feel 
so connected to other groups like ours and all these amazing folks who have raised their hand from our very first drop to say, hey, like you put into words what I feel. We feel like we're peers with ourselves, with others. And that's just extremely motivating. And it lets you not like try to extrapolate to some distant place to strategize what's the move for this? How do we create the moat for this? You know, all this shit. Instead, and operating through releases, it's just sort of like, what does it feel like the next thing we're supposed to do is? And that's like a emergent truth that lives with us in a group, as a group. Like we know what we're here for, but we keep working project by project, drop by drop. That creates focus. That creates a high level of output. That lets you learn and iterate. Uh, it lets you just be creative and not like strategic and corporate and analytical. Like it's just, these are creative acts. These are like acts of love. These are acts of curiosity. These are like, you know, one, one thing we started doing early on, like there would be this terror of right before we put something out of like, oh shit, that are we, are we just like, is this going to be a disaster? Oh my God. And uh, for those first three drops, I would ask in our discord, because we've all been distributed until recently. I would say, can we all hold hands? And so in a Discord, everyone write like holding hands, you know? And so then when we go to push the drop live, it's not like just one person's name and ego that's on the line, but it's like we're together in this. And that difference of just like one person being behind a project to like one plus five in plus six, you know, it's like the emotions of that are so different. And none of these are things that I like, that I anticipated at the start of this. These have just been things we've discovered by very earnestly and sincerely just following these feelings, following what feels true, following what we feel like we need. And so, yeah, so I think that's like part of the secret of this project. And I think the equilibrium we want to stay within as we keep operating. So there's a lot of constraints we try to, we're also giving to our project to ensure that we don't end up in mediocrity, which is the default state of every collaborative project is mediocrity. And so, yeah, so I don't know. It's, it's like hyper sincere, like the frame we've even given for this series of quality drops is new sincerity. Everything we want to release is something that feels like true from the heart, not, not strategic, not someone trying to get their bag, not someone like reading what's trending, but like what are creative acts that are truly emanating from someone's soul? That's why we're here. You know, that's how we came together. That's what we think is most powerful. That's what we think resonates. And that's like, yeah, that's kind of in the room with us when, whenever we're making choices. Scott, do you want to add something to this, especially in terms of the collection or what Jensen just said? I just think it's a really important uh, like topic at a time when I think every scene goes through this process. Um, and there's some really great uh, like writing on this, like meeting this has some great pieces on this. Um, ben Katesh Rao has some great pieces on this. And like, I think it is, which, you know, I, I think is what happens when sometimes, um, you, you can't really just like passionately align on a, a given direction. Like, I think that's such an important thing to like consistently be able to do. I mean, and we're hoping, I mean, in some ways that QF like pluralistically allows people to do that. Like ideally, if you have tools for this kind of coordination, you can better do that. But I think it's also this constant um, like battle to keep that kind of uh, level of, of passion uh, sort of alive as as scenes like Ethereum or or Web3 or you know whatever we want to call it uh, grow even that alone right is sort of a, a part of our our challenge we have all these terms and we kind of have to keep changing them because they keep getting co-opted in various capacities so uh, I definitely resonate uh, with those with those challenges and I think that's been like something that we've like really um, like strived for in in our work and i think that's being really critical to keeping something uh sort of like the liberal radicalism vision of quadratic funding which in some ways actually i think ties really nicely into into like anti here like post individualism work alive and and i think that's uh something that is probably one of the most important things for anyone sort of listening to take away from this is you know having those rituals having those processes to kind of like embrace uh not i think sincerity is a great way to put it but i think in in, in addition uh, emotional resonance is really really just important as you build um and and as you scale uh, any kind of any kind of movement and this is the right moment to have both of your takes on the creator economy and what comes after the creator economy yancy meta label co-wrote uh well with multiple authors after the creator economy 
Could you tell us why you think the creator economy is not the right term necessarily? And why we should focus more on the term ecosystem, on multiplayer creativity? And after this, Scott, in terms of Gitcoin, how are you going from kind of a more developer community to creators and developing over the years? Yeah, I mean, I think creator economy is a VC term. It was a term created by A16Z to talk their own bag. And that's why it exists straight up. It's to create more capital inflow into a category of projects they saw themselves as being a leader of. And people have adopted it. You know, pe people have adopted that phrase. The challenge, the challenge of that phrase is, you know, to have it be about an economy, of course, is to make it transactional, is to make it about uh, what is the financial upside of this? It's like, what is the total addressable market of creativity? You know, we're going to get 1% of creativity on our platform um, and make it automatically recurring payments. It's like bleak, bleak fucking shit. And so it's just, it's just a capitalist mindset. Now, if you like go back to before that term, you know, Kickstarter predates that term. You know, clearly the internet has always been a powerful tool for creative people. Like the engineers who invented the internet were creative people. Like Tim Berners-Lee is a creative person. Like it is a natural habitat for uh, especially people who feel stifled by the real world to discover and manifest and explore who they actually are and to do that with the freedom of obscurity and anonymity. And, uh, you know, there's been no greater distribution or communications platform in, you know, human history. And so all those things are like so powerful and all that power predates the people selling their bags and, and trying to hype this up and announcing they're making a creator economy fund and all this shit. Um, and so the, the issue with it is that it just, it actually has very little relationship to creativity or to an artist, an artist's life. Like... You know, I, I'm someone that believes that all creative people are like speaking from the same source, this new sphere, this idea space that we're like seeking to represent truth from as filtered through our own experience. And like that, that is the creative act. That is why it's worthwhile. Like creativity is important, whether or not anyone looks at it, whether it sells or doesn't sell is not important to judging the quality of a creative work, whether you publish it or don't publish it has no bearing on the meaning of a creative work. And so just the framing of creator economy, just, it's just such a, just such a dead end. It just says the point of this is maximizing followers. So you can maximize income. So you can blah, 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 blah. And that's just a treadmill to unhappiness, but it's also a treadmill to good returns for VC funds. And, uh, and all they do is tweet all day because that's the job is to position yourself as an influencer. And so creative people looking for meaning and how to succeed, they end up listening to VCs way more than they should instead of actual creative people. And everyone's been like Kool-Aided into this shit. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a temporary condition that has been marketed to death. How do you think, Gensi, or maybe I'll ask you, Scott, uh, how do you think that in this new paradigm uh, or economy, uh, we can empower creators? So if we don't call it the creator economy, uh, if we have a new system, what would it look like for you? Uh, maybe Scott, you can touch on this before you answer. It definitely resonate with all that. Um, I think that it's just crazy how in some ways, and I think this is all probably emblematic of, of the same or like related problems. Maybe they're not exa exactly the same, but like there's certainly just this culture we're in, which is partly like result of hundred plus years at this point of like not capitalism itself necessarily. I actually like I'm not going to go and like defend it, but like, I think there's like a lot of like value in, in some kind of like model of, of like return, but probably not the same one that, that exists in, in VC context today. But I think that like, there's this hundred year trend towards trying not to, yeah, to create, but to extract. And I think that is where the incentives have fallen off. And I don't think that there's any reason it has to be that way. I think it was maybe Toby Shoren who I originally heard this from, but this phrase of the economy economy perfectly encapsulates that to me because the entire idea of, yeah, calling something like Yancy saying at, at like at the X economy just totally flattens like the actual value and, and reason and, and meaning behind that thing. And I think that's a uh, fundamentally mistake. And I think it also probably, I guess, ironically or like counter counterintuitively, like restricts the actual value that that thing can 
can create. And I think we're all talking about sort of aligning uh, AI and, and so forth. Like, I think it's just like a matter of kind of aligning ourselves around just how we think about what it is that we value and, and coordinating around that. That doesn't really directly answer your question, but I definitely, I just really, uh, no, I those pieces, cool. but like, uh, just to like quickly, to, to quickly touch on the, the question, like, I think the way to empower creators is one to, to release, yeah, to some degree, those, those constraints. And I think secondarily to figure out just different mechanisms beyond the traditional economy for them to, to work within. And I think yeah, like meta labels are a great example of this. I think new types of on-chain, you know, quote unquote coordination, uh, are, are ways of thinking about this. And I think probably most fundamentally, we just need to actually create new models for creators to connect with each other, understand each other, and to do that in a way that, yeah, isn't flattened by the dimensions of the mediums that we're choosing. You know, widespread financial precarity is a inescapable truth of most places in the world. And creative people are, you know, just as much a part of that, if not more in some cases. You know, the part of the creator economy that speaks to people is maybe this is my way out. Maybe I can leave my shit job. Maybe I can dedicate more time to what it is I care about and love doing. And, you know, that is a genuine dream and goal that I think we've all shared at various points of our lives, maybe right now. And that's, there's truth to that, no doubt. I think this, the struggle with this most recent decade is that the creator economy framing and the technological primitives behind these social media platforms have all pushed people to like be the star of your show, your own channel, amass as many followers and likes as possible. That is the path out. That is the path out of the conditions that uh, entrap you. What we can clearly see after a decade is that that is the path for platforms to capture more financial value. That is a path to drive activity and to please advertisers. The fact that a creative person may get paid in the end off of that is like truly secondary. Uh, to those other concerns at the at the biggest possible picture. I think the way out of that is we challenge those core assumptions that says the people with whom you most share a point of view, like right now you feel like they're your frenemy. You know, if they have a really great newsletter that goes viral on the same topic you write about, like you lost and they won. And there's like this weird feelings of jealousy that arise in us. And instead, we need to find structures by which people with whom we share the same worldview, where we can support each other in a genuine way. And so like the world I see is one where for-profit companies exist to maximize capital returns. Nonprofits exist to maximize a, a mission, a social mission. And culture labels and meta labels exist to maximize a cultural vision. And uh, a meta label is an operating system for a group of creative people who share the same worldview to release work together and to share resources and support one another. The system we're building and that we're demonstrating with Gitcoin and SongCamp and uh, MedLab and more groups to come is going to show how a group of people who might not be immediately connected to each other, but how they can come together and release work that manifests their shared vision. They all get paid. Uh, it generates a return to their treasury of their group, which can be used to fund next projects, to put out other people's work, to give yourselves advances, to do larger projects, and to break the sense that you must compete against everyone else for attention and for your work to stand out. Creative people want this. Like This is how we naturally operate. Like the feeling of collaboration fills us with love and spirit because it's truthful uh, in a way that grinding away to win like fills us with dread and emptiness because it's because it is that. And I really see the past decade as it's just about these technological conditions that we've lived in as just this very first phase of the internet. It's just this very it's this, it's just this period of time that we're going to look back on and be like, oh my God, can you remember? when we all did this and it's going to feel silly. And, and I, I believe in my heart of hearts, like three, five years from now, this is going to be such a normal way of seeing things. And it's what is already in people's hearts. It just hasn't been clear how to do it. It ends up, you know, on chain structures, you know, grease the wheels and become useful plumbing for parts of this, but it doesn't actually have to have a blockchain for this to, for this to exist. Like. Most of the prior art for meta labels are things that that predate almost all modern technology, like the Royal Society in 1660 
it was doing the same shit. You know, it didn't need Stripe. It didn't need a Ethereum. It didn't need any of that. It just needed groups of people to support each other. So it's bigger than technology. It is bigger than a blockchain. But, you know, what the on-chain era has done is made it more apparent how we can do things like that, how we can share resources, how we can de-individualize and move into a post-individual universe online. And that that is what's happening around us. Like that is the bigger story that's bigger than any of us, that's bigger than any of our projects. It's happening. Now, you know, VCs will figure out their way to reframe it to their, once again, to their backs. But like that, that truth is, is it's going to escape the narratives. You know, it's going to be real. Scott opened Pandora's box earlier, mentioning AI. Uh, and so if we're in this new economy of meta labels, how can we empower creators in a world where there is artificial intelligence? So we have TikTok, Meta, Google, and they make money by having users addicted to their content. Uh, it's a bit cliche what I'm saying, but there's a large truth to it. And so in the era of meta labels of artificial intelligence, how do we empower the creators and how can we use AI? Will it be a good thing for creators? So don't expect a perfect answer. Uh, we can't read the future, obviously, but would love to hear your takes. Scott, do you want to go first? I just think, yeah, everything we're talking about is particularly relevant to where the ecosystem, I mean, I, I fall into this trap of, I think a lot of people do of saying like the ecosystem or the, the space, but like, we're just talking about like people working on these, these types of tools, uh, more decentralized technologies. Um, I think for me, that group is definitely getting to the early majority, like sort of phase of its life in which there is more risk of, of capture and there's more risk of corporatization. And there's more risk of us losing this sort of like ethos that we, yeah, we sort of started, started with. And I think to answer your question, like, I think this is particularly important in this sort of like post AI world in which the stakes accelerate. I mean, not to be at the risk of being, um, a very, just repeating every, every, uh, you know, podcast out there, they're, they, they're, they're exponential. It's big. It's a large, it's a large increase in the stakes. And the point there is that if we don't get this right now, uh, we may not get it right at all. And that's like very bad for not just creators, but just for all kinds of activities that we all participate in, um, in, in the world and, and by in the world, I mean, also like increasingly online, like, I mean, the world is digital now. And I think that's kind of to some degree what answer you're saying with like the last 10 years of the internet are just this early stage where we kind of viewed as this other thing that we like, weren't really actually on that we weren't really like doing most of our living on. And I think that's definitely flipped to, to the point where like most things are actually starting digitally. And then being like kind of mapped to or like instantiated physically versus the other way around where you have some local community and you have like your forum or whatever that might be. So there's a lot at risk if we don't get this right. And I think that the, the power of AI is on the one hand, yeah, we have like the ability for anyone to kind of take the entire collective memory of humanity um, up to 2021, I think, uh, right now, and to leverage that to create new things. Which I do think is fundamentally a creative act, by the way. Like I, I think there's a lot of controversy around like how does this add like attribute value and so forth, which I think is like extremely valid. Um, but the problem isn't how does this attribute value? The problem is um who benefits from that attribution. And I think right now, to your point, there's like four companies basically who I think their entire strategy for the next 10 years will just be acquiring as many new data sources as they possibly can to then find ways to slightly improve the outputs of their LLM so that they can slowly increase their profitability and so forth. And that's a massive consolidation of power. Um, that massive consolidation of power not only hurts creators, but again, uh, just will generally create um, huge amounts of inequality that will create like political and other forms of instability, um, which is to say like even just practically, this is actually a very important thing for us to be mindful of for anyone listening who, who has potentially uh, uh, any, any policy making decisions. Um, I don't think that means that we should just stop AI. I think it actually means that we should uh, decentralize it in some fashion uh, and, and the controls uh, of it. Yeah. Basically, if we can, if we can get this right, on the other hand, to be less doomer about it, like there's a real potential for us to like fundamentally reconfigure how we think about creative acts and to 
do that in a way that actually is fundamentally more collective. When it comes to cyber resistance, right? So in this new paradigm, in this new economy, how do you offer creators proof of skill, proof of humanity, obviously Gitcoin Passport? Um, you can maybe touch on this, but do you also see other options to really go beyond in this new paradigm? I think you actually just need a lot of signatures. Like, I think that's like kind of like, there's a great piece by Andy Tadhope, who kind of was the, the uh, real creative genius behind a lot of the kernel syllabus. And I think his point with signature economy or, or you know, hopefully we don't call it an economy, but like a, a model of like signatures online, the, the, the point of that is is to have attribution without needing to even really think about it and just have that be even secondary to the act itself. And so you stop worrying about the like supply chain of your like production of your art and you start worrying about like just producing cool things that will naturally make their way into this sort of like guys this like egregore that we're sort of creating to tie this all sort of together like the benefit that like pro case of this ai world is actually that we can create a form of collective intelligence and i kind of would differentiate these um perhaps in a way that uh WSA and others have done uh like better or more holistically as the difference between uh, coming to decisions with a group of people that are like in the present that are with you now and then making decisions sort of just like based on these ghosts of like past like things that we we've, we've done collectively you know that are now sort of like in the, the the machines like quite literally and i think that world with this attribution uh with this sort of like um automated sort of chain of, of, of reference actually really opens up a lot of interesting dynamics around just like how creators work together. This is probably like eventually, Yancy, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you for uh, the meta label LLM product specification or something, uh, trying to dive into that. But I think that to me is the fundamental bro case of AI. And we're, we're definitely, I do worry, like, again, I don't want to be too like doomer about it, but I do worry we're not really headed there right now. So you're worried we're not going there because it's a bad thing or because it's going to take a long time? Just because the incentives are not aligned for it, right? I mean, that's the, these companies just want to aggregate, you know, as much data as possible. It's the same incentives we've sort of talked about with the tension economy over the last 10 years. And I think that like, there needs to be some fundamental, I think this just goes back to what we were sort of saying in the beginning is like, there needs to be a fundamental shift of these incentives for us to actually get to the, the good ending uh, so to speak. Yancy, do you see verifiable credentials as a solution to what we mentioned earlier? Uh, so the Web2 platform risk. So in this post-creator economy, uh, where do you see verifiable credentials? And do you agree or align with what Scott just said, or do you have a different perspective? I think Scott was, was pretty on point. I mean, I think Ted Chiang had the line about people don't fear technology, they fear capitalism with technology. I honestly don't care about AI. I don't find it very interesting. Um, I can't think of any problem or passion or love of my life that I feel like is really impacted by it in a way. Like like my problems and challenges are about human relationships and about who I want to be, how to be for people, what my neighborhood is like. I just don't, that just feels very disconnected to me from AI. So yeah, it's just not fundamentally that compelling to me not to you know, discounted or anything. Um, how to verify identity, things like that. Sure. I mean, yesterday I listened to Kanye sing Hey There Delilah through uh, through some AI model. You know, that shit is uh, crazy. I have a very good friend of mine is a wonderful painter who like, of course, searched his own name in Mid Journey a year ago and saw paintings that were like ones he was currently working on that hadn't been published before. And that was like a real existential shock of what even am I? Um, so my attitude to most of this is just say, who wants this? Like, I don't think any artist, to me, AI is for non-creative people who want to be creative. I feel like the creative act is that struggle with yourself to pull out truth from the source. And uh, yeah, I feel like it's a non-creative approach to creativity in a way. Yeah, just not my passion, not where my energy goes. Awesome. I think this is the perfect moment to open up the discussion to anyone in the audience that has a question or would like to share their thoughts. Uh, maybe we'll start with Sofiane, our solutions architect at New Foundation. I think he has a lot to say on what comes after the creator economy, and then anyone in the audience can come in. 
uh and this might give a little break to Jens and scott yeah uh guys thank you so much it was so delightful this conversation at the beginning it felt like research and very academic and stuff but i felt a lot of meaning everything makes so much sense even though we talked about new frontiers i think we don't know how things look like when creators longer uh you know live in this like measurement matrix or treadmill that you described and i think it's fine we we have to explore i think that any innovation starts with the directional thinking and then we, we will figure things out as as we move forward i definitely see with web3 uh reunion one thing that web3 does very well on the technical side everyone is like kind of divided and like oh this layer one or that technology and whatever but on the purpose, I think it has been an instrument that has reunited a lot of minds from like all horizons, uh, finance, uh, technology, creativity, content, and so on. So this is awesome. And, and you are a great example of that, I think, because you, you come from like different backgrounds and, and you are collaborating and, and reaching consensus on like those very important uh, topics. I would encapsulate actually creativity into a maybe an even bigger container. So first, I completely agree about engineers. I think that maybe the container for creativity is choice as like the biggest, you know, way to look at it from like the way we, we choose to act. We had the expression of, of like our being and not necessarily like where we come from, but like what we decide to do, what we create, what we execute. And yeah, I guess my question, actually, it's funny, I was ready to like start with an AI question, but I think you covered like most of the points. Uh, I would say maybe the main one is like, what do you think about the power of the fractionalization of creativity and the ability for humans to co-create through basically um, being able to make like all those decisions, all those like micro decisions, all this curation part of like a loop. And so it kind of gets into the, the territory of like the way reinforcement learning works with AI. But we could remove the AI and say, okay, the, the starting point actually of new foundation and where it, where it all started was in 2014 when Tumblr started to disrupt the fashion industry. So when you look at fashion, basically all the like value of all those brands, all the consensus that is reached on like this brand is cooler than that, there is nothing tangible about it. It's completely based on consensus. And then Tumblr came and it accelerated the consensus from the fashion week and it created this like very interesting like control revolution within fashion with Kanye also that's played a role in that. And so all those like micro decisions, all this like gossip that happens between people about this and not that, and like this whole like curation that shapes culture and that brings people together into this like co-creation of the zeitgeist of like, this is going to be 2025, let's say. And we will look back at it like 30 years from now and we say, okay, that was 2025. What's your take on that in terms of like, technology and how people basically find the, the path towards consensus. I, I think that like exactly, I, I actually agree with the idea of consensus building as the important question here. Cause like, I think when we talk about, yeah, like any, whatever, like AI, these things, there's this idea of like this thing that's totally separate from ourselves. And I think that's sort of where we're heading. But I do think that like this idea of more uh, like collective intelligence is just like a almost enhancement or like kind of like cybernetic like approach to the way we view these tools and, and i think that like in in the context you're talking about the question is like how do people like more like accurately share references or like ideas with each other so an example would be you know i have an idea of a piece in my head and you know i don't really know how to articulate that like if, if there's better ways for me or like better tools i can use to articulate that you know, whether that's something that's more generative or, or something that's like, for example, like more expressive, like a pedal with a guitar, like something that like better captures the emotion that you're trying to convey. Then if we're collaborating, we can actually better create together from that better projection of the like mental map that I have that I might not like properly otherwise be able to express. And so I think that to me is an exciting like potential outcome. I, I think we need to do better in like kind of all the ways we, this is a really good question because it kind of encapsulates everything we talked about here. Like we just have very bad ways of doing that, uh, both in terms of incentives, in terms of like current, like just systems online. And then now we're sort of like accelerating all those things in the wrong direction. So I fundamentally think that technology can improve creativity, but I think it's, it's like, and, and, and collaboration, but we're not there yet. I mean, this is, this is a reason why I'm glad that 
the age of Twitter is over because that was a period of clout based, clout chasing, social peacocking to where now I think where we've reached an age where more people are invested in predicting a thing is going to happen than they are actually doing anything. Because in the land of VC, you coin the term, whether or not you make anything, hey, you coin the term, you get the clout. And so trend forecasting, all that, it's just, it's a, it's a form of social peacocking and clout chasing that, you know, appeals to a certain mindset and, you know, it's fine. Just the danger is it takes energy away from actually doing the shit, which is what is truly required. And yeah, so I, I celebrate the demise of Twitter and think it's a top five thing to happen to humanity in the last decade is it's self implosion. That's why I say like hundred percent. Yes. It's just ridiculous to me that like, and this is again, part of the acceleration of like the space that the, again, I'm going to keep saying this, but like those days it's the acceleration of like, okay, you did something for like a month and like, you know, you kind of would have teased out about it, but like, what did you really like do exactly? Like what? Yeah. Like what did you really, and, and, and what was it to you? Like what, you know, was it to your point, like authentic to you in some sense? I just think Twitter, yeah, really accelerated that trend. I don't know if Twitter is in demise yet, but if we can, uh, if we can try and, try and make that happen, I, I will full send that. I think Elon is Gorbachev is my current, is, is my theory, actually. It's uh, an inept <laughs> reformer takes it down from within. That is in the process of happening. I love that. Bring on the post-Soviet states of social media. I see a couple hands up. Uh, maybe Jules, do you want to do a short intro and go for it? Thank you guys both. Um, what a lovely morning. I love talking about this because I'm building Enzo, which is in the intersection of Web3 social and fashion. And as we know, fashion is all about status. And we talk about it all the time, and especially with Gen Z. And I would love to see like how you guys see the future work. I know it's a little bit off and kind of your understanding of what Web3 social could be for Gen Z, especially since it's, you know, Gen Z has focused like all their life on on the internet. So I am always I'm trying to understand how fashion can create more impact. But my sole purpose in all of this is focusing a lot on how brands and designers can actually own their market. So if you guys can talk a little bit about that, that'd be amazing. The the thing that resonates to me about that in, in Web3 and Web3 social generally, this is like the thing that I think we've circled around here is what is the difference between audience and community and how do you actually build community? Even community is a buzzword now, which is like, I just, I feel like there needs to be like a better way to, unfortunately, like as again, like things scale as, as movements grow, you need like better and better ways to like differentiate these things. But I think something like a focus on community is probably the most effective thing here. And I actually think focusing on community uh, without that being even tied to a token or tied to any particular financial item, it is sort of the way forward. And again, I would just sort of like highlight Andy, I think is someone who has done a really good job of really articulating that in with, with kernel and trying trying to like figure out like what are the concepts in this new sort of like world we're heading to that like we should sort of latch on to and find meaning in and how do those basically like improve our relationships with each other i think if social media in some form i don't think maybe social media doesn't need to be a fundamentally bad term like something like that can be created then we'll be in a much better space i do worry about this though again like i'm, I'm just like it feels like a very hard problem to me. I don't know what comes next after this. I don't know. Not to put you on the spot, Yancy. Maybe, maybe you have a better idea. Sure, I'll, I'll let you all know what's going to happen. So I think I think your perspective, Jules, is like extremely important and valuable. Like true internet natives, like that is human history moving forward. Like kind of starts with you. There was a fascinating thing that happened in the year 1000 AD when in Southern Europe the Catholic Church made these announcements that you could no longer marry your cousin. Okay. And so at the time that this happened, most families were clan based, just a lot of like you there's a patriarch, matriarch, many generations, the family was the religion. And these families would tend to marry cousins to each other to reinforce the power of family. And then the Catholic church says, Hey, you can't do that. You're like outcast if you do that. And within a couple of generations, this completely remade society to where there needed to be new places where people could meet people from other families and because these social institutions were needed, this is what drove the growth of cities. This is what drove the invention of the university 
and of the guild and of monasteries grew in, in prominence around this time. And this was the first moment that people became individuals, right? You weren't jewels of clan. You wouldn't even say your name first. You're like daughter of whoever in whatever clan, you know, and by the way, I have a name Jules, like instead you became Jules. And what happened was that people began congregating and then they needed these institutions that would help give them context. Like, how do I find a trade? How do I find people like me? How do, and this is where uh, universities, guilds, cities were invented. I believe that is the same process happening today, that the internet re-individualized us and made it so that we grow up in a geographic place, the children of parents, siblings or whoever, we have this context we sit within. But then the second we go online, we discover we can be whoever and how many ever we want to be. And we've been dealing with that and experienced the power and the isolation of that. And what's happening now is that just like those first guilds, universities, cities, we are creating the places of context where we can be safe, where we can be productive, where we can find each other, where we can have like genuine social connection and achieve what we want as these new kinds of, like this new type of individual. And so I think of this period as like a post-individual period. It's what happens after we become individualized. And what happens is we have to create ways of meaning and connection and like safety with each other. And this is the period we're in now. And I believe that like Gen Z and younger are especially going to be invested in creating these sorts of places and frames. And that this is how like we're going to get past the, we'll, we'll harness the power and get past the limits of these systems. But I think that's, I think we're all like little ants in this bigger story, but it's very similar to something all of humanity went through about a thousand years ago. This is so on point. I love that you said about meaning, connection, and safety. Like that, that is such a quote for me in this whole context. And uh, I would love to like jump in and say various things on this whole topic, but I uh, definitely want to hear from Wonderverse. I think there's some really interesting questions probably coming away from your connections to the Gitcoin community and also related to like color style that you're working with. So I'd love to hear what's, what you have to ask and contribute. Yeah, so I guess it's just more of like a reflection. So I'm N, pronouns are they that I'm head of community at Wonder um, or Wonderverse. And in Wonder, just for people who don't know, Wonder is building Web3 enabled, um, I would say community collaboration, organizational competence tools for DAOs, but just for digital communities in general. I think what I've been like, so I'll just give a little more heart of myself. I'm 27. My birthday is actually in a few days. I'm going to be 28. And I think, you know, in this moment of my life, I'm kind of just like, we need to like make a stance about what we believe. Right. And Yancy, I really love kind of your approach in the conversation because like at the end of the day, it's either are we about maximizing profit or are we about maximizing human prosperity? Right. And those are two very different metrics. And I think that in Web3, I love what Gitcoin has done because it's taken a stand of like, we want to maximize human prosperity. Right. That's the goal. And I think under this kind of like, you know, at least in the US, so this like just heavy capitalistic framing where it's all about profit maximization, I think we get lost in the sauce. And I, I think it's actually quite simple. And Web3, the fundamental technology, I think makes us think in a more collective way because it's a collective technology, right? We're all like, we all have to put our stuff on chain. We all share the chain, right? It's a common in a way. We just need to make decisions. And I think the trajectory of Web3, I guess this is, this would be my question. In the trajectory of Web3, like, is it really about anything more than stating what we believe? I don't know if you're familiar with like the Plan B movement the idea that like plan A is capitalism, profit, financial maximization. Plan B is search for other forms of meaning. And it's sort of like people saying, we want to create a different path. There's a lot of great philosophers that explore this. My, I was just talking to someone last night about this. Uh, I think web three is like 70% plan A of like, let me get rich and beat the game. And then there's a smaller subset of, I say this affectionately, nerds which is all of us uh, who are in it because we're optimistic about the future and because we have those plan B values and because we see this as a tool for that. I do think we're in the minority. I do think like 
all the bullshit is the bullshit because it's all the plan A shit. And like, I worry deeply about being a good player in a bad game in this space. But yes, I agree that there is a choice. And these choices aren't like, they don't have to be in deep conflict. They have to live together, I think is what's really necessary. And like all of human history says all of these things are both there. It's never just one thing. How do they, how are they both there? But yeah, I, I feel you. I, I, I think that's certainly why I'm here, but I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm a majority position in the space at all, but it is, it's why I'm still here. And it, it's, it's, it's why I love people like Scott and, you know, all kinds of folks I've met in the space. It's amazing. And think bringing this back from the, the whole concept around the creators and engineers, Boris, like I definitely, definitely want to hear what you have to say around this whole thing and your involvement with Gitcoin and how this potentially relates also with DSI because that is something that is like not even ready launched yet that I think is going to have so much opportunity with the creativity and the funding mechanisms. So Boris would love to hear what you have to say and any questions you have. I've seen Dominique waiting for a while to say something, so I, I don't mind uh, going after. Um, it was more just of an observation because I had questions along uh, the talk and then, you know, you kept answering them, you know, the, the flow went on, on, like, on that way. I mean, I'm Dominique, I am part of New Foundation team, and I'm a, a researcher in the Transmedia Fashion Research Group. So what was on my mind while I was hearing you all talk is how important it is to keep on going with these phases of conversation and research, because to build again, or, or not again, but to build a sense of community and to build a place that we can accompany each other in actually creating something, you know, meaningful and you know, how Yancy was talking at the beginning of the, of the talk about that sense of loneliness, that kind of like Web3 is trying to recompose. I believe then that these research groups are the most important parts to accompany, you know, the building of the products that we need for that community to happen. Um, so we have another research group that is called Transmedia Fashion Research Group, and its main point of study and I wouldn't say it's a discipline because I believe more and more that it's just a way of seeing things, is um, understanding fashion beyond just garment creation and understanding fashion just as also as a, um, as a way to kind of like prefigure the future. So how fashion is, you know, intersect by media platforms and by different storytellings that are actually you know, living in the world with us right now, everywhere. My main point here was to keep these research groups happening, to keep the conversation not biased and keep, you know, press spaces we, where we can feel like we can be honest and not condescending. Because if we're always, you know, agreeing with what the other people are saying, it's just like we're not going to be anything different than what Web2 was about. So that was my and comments. Thank you. So buddies, please go ahead. Hello everyone. For those of you who I haven't met, uh, my name is Boris and I'm actually like pretty new to Web3, maybe got into all this about a year and a half ago. For context, I'm a scientist. I'm trying to finish my PhD in molecular genetics and I was not really happy with the academic system and the opportunities that I saw, even though that's what I had pursued for a long time. And then when I learned about the you know, uh, the business of science, the biopharm industry, I'm particularly inspiring. So I was on this journey of trying to figure out what I could do to improve science and almost serendipitously discovered DSI as it was just kind of becoming a thing. Like I was learning about DAOs and Web3 and trying to understand what all the hype was about and realized there were people in that space who were trying to use this technology to improve science. And it was just like, okay, cool. What's this all about? And I realized that Philosophically and I guess technologically, there's just a lot that science can get from blockchain technology. And when I really dug into it and, and sort of understood how it works, I just kind of got got lost in it and it's been a crazy year and a half. Right now, part time, I am actually working with Gitcoin and focusing on DSI funding specifically, um, because this is like an emerging kind of topic that needs funding. Projects are still trying to figure out what is DSI, how do we improve science with this technology. And I feel like, yeah, well, what you were just saying about 70% of Web3 and crypto being plan A, just like, how do we make money? How do we create new systems that'll give different people power, hopefully us and make us rich? Um, and I guess also improve the legacy systems. Um, 
I think there's just so much opportunity to explore in other fields that have not yet been touched by it. Like if you talk to a scientist and you say crypto or blockchain, they're immediately disgusted because they only hear the bad stuff. Um, and I guess I, I was just really fortunate to early on meet well-aligned people and discover things like Gitcoin and public goods funding and see that this technology can be used for very positive use cases. There's, there's a lot to say about this. Um, I'm very excited about things like attestations and verifiable credentials for improving how we track reputation in science and how we reward people for contributing to human knowledge. There's a ton, I think, of DSI that's focused on later stages of innovation around intellectual property and funding things that might become products or drugs or, or something like that. But I think where I've kind of found my calling in here, at least for the time being, is thinking about things that don't have a business model things like art potentially, or things like basic research, which are good for people. It's good for all of humanity. Um, it's just more knowledge. And it's hard to fund these things because they don't necessarily have a business model, right? So how do we, how do we create incentives and games around the 70% plan A BS that result in, um, in essential things being funded without having to rely on governments? So those are the questions I'm thinking about a lot. Uh, this has been really fun to listen to everyone. Please feel free to reach out if you want to discuss some more. I'm here and I'd love to talk. I think that's awesome just to think about what this sort of new model of, I mean, I'm obviously biased towards this, like public goods funding might look like. I actually really like the web A, web B framing. And the only thing I'll just, I want to quickly touch on, which I thought of in that thread is the fact that, and I think Yancy sort of touched on this, like there, it's not really as much of like a like binary choice as it seems it's actually uh like much more of a gradient and the like way that i i think about this is actually going back to the sort of uh like optimism approach to like things like retroactive public good funding or how we basically reward value in a, or and like assign value based on like real impact um yeah versus uh you know strictly just um financial metrics but recognizing that like impact can lead to to sustainability and that's one gradient that i think is important but the, the other gradient is about the sort of web one web two divide and it's actually in particular the work that sort of like john perry barlow did in like 1996 he wrote the declaration of independence for like uh basically talking about how privacy and a sort of open internet would prevail and how it would be just a natural part of the tapestry of the world that we live in and how he was super excited for that world. And I think obviously, uh, we all know at this point that he did not quite, uh, predict that correctly. And web two is very much not that. And I think what's interesting to think about there is that the moments of change that we go through as a society, and this is sort of end to your like point of like, do we have to just like choose and define our values? It's not always a, a switch that's just flipped. We have to basically kind of consistently and and kind of unrelentingly work towards these things. And even when we think we might be in a position that you know Web three has uh, ossified or, or solidified into some kind of sort of idea of the future that we we align with, we have to just make sure that we're we're still pushing those things forward because it is always this gradient that we're in. And we could easily just be like, uh, like uh, John Perry Barlow, and just accidentally end up on in, in the wrong the wrong domain without sort of like careful deliberation. So I just think that's a really important point because, yeah, like you know, Web three, I think is rightly uh, decried in some ways as like because of the seventy percent as just now sort of being like financial games. And I think we sort of talked about the fact here that you know a lot of that is is fueled by various sort of like background forces. And I think it's sort of incumbent on us to keep having those conversations and making those statements of values just so that we don't end up sort of in web two uh, in a sense. Thank you so much. I see you are slightly over time. So maybe if you have any final thoughts, uh, Scott and Yancy, and then Madeline can have the closing words, uh, unless there's an urgent question, but just in case anyone has a hard stop. Yancy, Scott. Yeah, well, you know, I just uh, appreciate being with Kindred Spirits. Feel so grateful to be able to collaborate with Gitcoin and Scott and so many other great folks over the past couple of years. This Web A, Web B language was like here on the spot, but I'm like making notes about it. I think that's actually kind of an important way of thinking because 
it's not about technological generations, which is like what Web 2, Web 3 is, because like Web A projects can be crypto. They can be ad supported networks. They can be all kinds of things. Web E projects can include Substack. They can include Open Collective. They can include things that don't touch a blockchain. And that feels like an important distinction that I haven't really thought about before. So I'll probably ask chat GPT to make a tweet thread for me about today. Um, but yeah, that, that feels like, a an, an, an just like something worth noticing and thinking about. And, um, and yeah, just appreciate the space that new forum creates and, uh, and glad to be here. Thank you so much, Yancy. Uh, Scott, any final thought? I just think this is, yeah, a great conversation and a very necessary one. Um, and I think it's one that we, we sometimes have, but maybe less frequently have. Like I, I definitely remember sort of like the 2016 era, um, there just being a lot more, uh, and perhaps like in some ways it's easier to have these conversations before the thing is, is in the world. But I think it's a really important time for us to re, uh, sort of re, uh, think and, and sort of unearth those conversations. And I'm glad that we're, we're sort of doing that, um, in, with places like new forum. And I also, yeah, I'm just very excited about the fact that there is this weird inflection point we're sort of in where people are recognizing that whether it's like the challenges of meaning and connection or whether it's like the sort of weird future science fiction world we're heading to like that there are a lot of things on the frontier and that we could actually just you know not fall prey to this idea of like determinism and actually make those things into a world that we actually want to see and i hope we do that um and i really appreciate the space to talk about that Madeline, any closing thoughts yeah and uh, i took so many notes during this session and i really love the fact that we take the time to sit in those values and for me personally that's been sort of my thesis for the last 10 years and like really going through past economic theories philosophies i love the answer that you mentioned the enlightenment right at the beginning and this whole process that is happening and why we're trying to have these conversations is to really think in a more meta-modern way so even beyond the enlightenment after the enlightenment came the post-structuralist the post-modernist etc and all of that phase, I think, is happening now. But what that phase had was the printing press. And that kind of accelerated all of those thoughts. But the process that we have now is that capital is being connected and engineering is being connected to this sharing of thoughts. And I think that's just going to absolutely fly to like actually put coding your values on the blockchain and in these different technologies. And this is so personally motivating and fascinating to to me and to everything that we've been trying to co-create with this concept of a new economy and new is in every every part of our ecosystem something that you're going to find because that is really what's important is this idea of innovation and how do we find through all these different players in the ecosystem we've had it and cello have been part of the audience today and we're going to talk more with them but it's really like all the different parts and pieces that have to come together to make this new cultivating and curating value and doing that through meaning and something that's always been sort of core to my to my own uh, research has been the idea of the human theory of value and it's something that I've been thinking about a lot in terms of what sort of structure protocol development DAP development we touched a little bit also on social three and all of those conversations with Jules and Enzo and I think it's just the time to have that ownership and the ability to curate in a non-toxic environment and to be able to actually have reflective thought through social media and no more like of this necessity to have followers, necessity to not pay attention to the value that's actually being curated and created. And everything with MetaLabel is also about that in terms of this shift from the individual to the collaborators and creating those mechanisms, I think is only gonna come through various players in web three who are actually doing the front of that culturally having the conversations creating the community layers and the in interface layers and then having that also the mechanism like core point underneath that we have to build so i think also about social and the kind of experience that we all feel is coming and yancy you said this that 
I feel like we've already all been knowing that this is coming and it's a feeling and we just need to express that now for a new type of social experience. And Scott, you said it might not actually be social media. And you and I talked about that a lot uh, when we met in Berlin and talking about this bigger philosophies about meaning making and how can you create interface experiences even for that. And that's exactly the topic today is about coordinating and curating that meaning. And for us, we're also looking at a lot of um, inputs, for example, Fernando Flores and all the work that has been done there about coordination. And it's something that we discussed before, but it's all of those philosophies that I think are resurfacing at this moment. And they're now to be put at the base layer with community owning the tech and then also in the interface layer and how you can have multiple versions of that interface to be able to experience something that's more co-owned, co-collaborative and curated. And that I think is creating a sense of safety that we haven't had on the internet, especially for creators, the concept of safety and this combination, like Jan, you said, I quoted you, it's meaning, it's, uh, it's connection and it's safety. And that's, that's what we need to produce now. And that's the kind of experience that I think we're ready for with Web3 and that we're creating with this, with this new forum space, with new foundation and also with new life. It's been such a interesting and fulfilling conversation. And this is a new format that we're doing. So I really love to hear everyone's perspective. So thank you so much for joining. Um, it's always possible to reach out. We will be hosting more and more of these sessions and everyone who is connected to New Forum is definitely part of the bigger family here with this mission and all the topics that we're talking about. So please uh, connect and join us next time. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, you, Madeline. Uh, those are the last words. Uh, hard to do better than this. <laughs> Thank you once again to Yancy, Scott and the audience. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Uh -huh.